Hi folks, cloud computing introduction, data engineering, and um, this is Jeffrey Fox, and this is part Q of our multi-part decomposition of this. And we're comparing here something which has actually been sketched earlier, simulations and big data. All right, let's go. So here we have um, the three little things we discussed. One is the actual structure of the application and how they differ in terms of their demands on software and hardware. Uh, some implications for software and some implications for languages. Because the languages used in the simulation world, which are typically C, C, C++, Fortran, and then maybe a little growing use of Python, uh, is pretty different from the Java, Go, uh, Erlang, dot, 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 a scalar, which is used in the big data world. Okay, and of course, Python's used in the big data world, and R used in statistics. So, um, so if you look at the overall structure of applications, we have, um, where well, we keep mentioning these, pleasingly parallel. That's important in both simulations. And the data case, although it's especially important, I think, in data, because uh, small simulation jobs are not always natural. Whereas small data jobs correspond to just processing single events. And that's always true in almost all data. Uh, if we look at streaming, um, streaming is very common in the data world, ubiquitous. Um, and it's not, and, and it's of course used in science, but it's not used in simulation so much. Although, if you're doing a weather simulation, you're doing data assimilation, which means data is being streamed in to continually be. I mean, data simulation is the idea that you do a better job by taking the um, simulation and merging in real time results from weather observations, and this effectively corrects for errors in the simulation. As a giant chi-squared fit between the simulation and the data and trying to get the best possible result. Um, of course, um, some of the problems like recommender engines don't really exist in science or in simulations. Um, search is again a dominant uh, big data problem, which you don't really see. In Again, either science or um, there's a little bit of search in science. It's not a dominant thing. Um, and also, those are different yet to uh, some of the machine learning, which are growing importance in um, big data. And uh, the difference is seen in terms of the hardware needs, the search and recommender engine, well, especially search. And pleasingly parallel jobs do not need lots of communication. Uh, whereas the things like subgraph mining is very, very communication sensitive, pretty hard to get an efficient algorithm. And we've already mentioned that we need to discuss data and model separately. Everything, in the, every problem has data and model. And uh, big data always has data, and simulations always have models, usually a big model. Uh, and they have maybe a little data with attached to the big model, or a little model attached to the big data. But actually, most problems are big data, pretty big data, and pretty big problem, pretty big model. Okay, another interesting feature is if you run a simulation, which is just a model, that model produces data, because you try to capture the results as a visualization. Uh, so simulations are a source of data. Um, it's actually this, however, there's also data, which is, if you go to your favorite uh, lectures on um, solving differential equations, you will learn about boundary conditions. Well, you need boundary conditions, so that's data. So simulations need boundary conditions. A data assimilation, as in the weather case, has the data not only just at the boundary, but also while the simulation is ongoing. I've already stressed that. Um, Single program multiple data is almost universal because it's the right, right way to write your program. And bulk synchronous processing is certainly important in both simulations and machine learning. 
MapReduce is an important big data paradigm because it actually allows you to parallelize databases or equivalent things to databases. It's not such a common simulation paradigm, although when you do some Monte Carlo problems, you have reduction operations after the after the simulations. I've also stressed a couple of decks ago that. Big data has large collective communication. That's only even first discussed when I introduced the six types of MapReduce and iterative MapReduce style three. It was characterized by large collective communication, whereas type four of the MapReduce styles was point to point. That was graphs and simulations. And uh, this large collective communication led us to introduce the map collective model for for big data problems. And we've already said many times that simulations have difference operators or corresponding to the differential operators being discretized, and that leads to nearest neighbor style sparsity. Data analytics can be sparse as in page rank and bags of worlds algorithms and uh, topic, I mean, uh, Facebook uh, um, linkage graphs. But they're not all, but those are sparse in a different fashion. Plus, some algorithms don't have any sparsity at all. If you look at a whole bunch of gene sequences, you can calculate uh, the connection between any two of those sequences using Smith Waterman or Niedemann Munch algorithms. Here is a picture I like to show, which uh, compares here a chemi uh, chemical molecule. And you have all these uh, things, um, well, these are macromolecules. So they, um, um, you have a bunch of objects joined together by bonds or forces, and that is a simulation problem. And here we have a Facebook graph. Well, that's who's connected to me. Well, they, they are sort of both nodes connected. and. One case, the connection is defined by the chemical forces, and in over in this case here, the Facebook case, the connections are summarized by who I know, <coughs> or who I who is annoyed with me, or whatever determines the connection. Um, so that says that graph problems and particle simulations with the forces. Have map point to point problem architecture and have some similarity in the way the simulation has to be done. And they have similar difficulties, namely, the connectivity is relatively hard to decompose efficiently, and uh, there's lots of technologies designed for that. Now, if we have full matrices like this gene problem I mentioned, where everything is connected to everything, that's like long range force problems in the simulation world. They are actually straightforward to parallelize full matrix algorithms, which are the easiest to do. And there is a, a lots of um, computer science work to be done to take these full matrix algorithms, which are actually they have the positive, they're easy to parallelize, but they have the negative that if you have n things, they're of order n squared. And if n is a billion, n squared is pretty big. So you try to reduce that uh, order n squared to order n log n. And um, that's the so-called fast multiple method when it's applied in simulations to, to speed up long range force problems. But that, that is not as clearly done in the big data field, although there are papers in this area. Um, when we're looking at all of these big data or simulations, we do need to look at the underlying hardware, because GPUs, uh, many core like Xeon Phi, Knight's, Knight's Landing, or classic multi chorus and classic Xeon. Um, they actually um, tell you how the maps, and because these are the computing, how those maps, are, computing maps are, are processed. And um, they need to be, um, um, in the, in the, the, how you map things to processes need uh, is that's not necessarily fixed, and uh, we need to um, study that a little more in the characterization. All right, 
Um, if you look at deep learning, it is actually effectively a four matrix because it's block sparse. I mean, it is sparse in terms of blocks of things interacting with each other, but within a block, it's a full matrix which can then exploit the GPU. Um, I've noticed that the HPC field is moving from full matrix algorithms uh, to characterize their computers to sparse matrix algorithms, HPCG, but actually, the non-sparse version of that conjugate gradient solver is what I use in a lot of my big data analytics because I'm trying to look at these problems where we have uh, every point connected to every other point. That's in the gene uh, sequence problem. We've already pointed out that actually some big data problems don't need high accuracy. You need high precision for simulations because you're doing difference operators, and that difference better be calculated accurately. But big data problems are not calculating differences. Uh, well, at least differences which are getting arbitrarily small as you make the, the separations arbitrarily small. And so that's why 16 or 32 bit computations for big data may actually be useful. Although, if you have, a, you, have you have machine learning and that machine learning has matrix algebra in it, matrix algebra may not work well on 32 bits because it's been all designed to run on high precision. Uh, systems. Um, and we know that global machine learning can benefit from HPC style interconnects, and that's as seen in GPU-based uh, deep learning. <coughs> so the original clouds were not good at global machine learning, but modern clouds which include systems with, with uh, optimized GPUs of high performance interconnects, they look pretty good. Um, <coughs> okay, so we pointed out the very large jobs are critical uh, feature of leading edge simulations, whereas data analysis, lots of small jobs. And so the sort of job size is, differs from between big data and simulations. And I wanted to point out that HPC machines are very successful. They are used to analyze big data, um, like data from light sources is run on HPC machines. Astronomy data is run on HPC machines, and that's good because the HPC machine will run well. But they may not be the most cost-effective solution, and you just need to remember that. Uh, obviously, if the machine's available, conveniently linked to the data, it's attractive to use it. It uh, doesn't mean it is the best machine if you really had the option of building the right machine for the right job, for each job. So let's look at software. Um, <coughs> so the big data software stack is being translated to HPC. The use of Docker by HPC and deep learning by HPC as examples. Um, and the big data community is using HPC, is using HPC clusters for deep learning, and is using GPUs and FPGAs for training deep learning systems, and probably they'll use even more. Um, I point out that Docker is the virtualization approach of choice compared to OpenStack, and Docker is acceptable to HPC. OpenStack is not acceptable, it's too slow. Even though you can use these SR, IOV technology to speed things up is still just not going to work. Um, some of these tools like Hadoop, Spark, Cassandra, HBase, these are programming models, these are databases, they are being used in science. Uh, the final slide discusses languages. I've, um, it's not trivial, namely Java is a dominant language, and the Java virtual machine is a dominant approach used in big data problems. But it has, Java has some difficulties, which I explored from a long time ago. In 1997, I set up the Java Grande project, which was meant to try to understand how to use Java in science. It sort of collapsed in 2000, because some microsystems collapsed in 2000, and they were my strongest supporter, because uh, the dot com collapse. Of course, dot com thrived thereafter, and Java thrived thereafter, but Java Grande couldn't, I couldn't take it through that uh, cataclysm. Um, 
But Java is actually now quite high performance, and in fact, if you work on it, you can get good performance. But there are some features, the use of objects, which need to be serialized for communication. Dynamic memory allocation, which needs garbage collection. They're pretty serious, because if you have garbage collection under the parallel job, that one node which is garbage collecting is holding up all the other nodes. It's unacceptable. So garbage collection must be avoided in a, a highly synchronized parallel job. Um, now you can, the Java MPI binding is very good. We've used that very successfully. And we also point out the scripting languages are very successful. And they're actually can be pretty efficient, because you don't run the whole job in the scripting language. The scripting language invokes optimized codes written in Java or C++ or machine code or what have you. So the language situation is actually less, I mean, that's, it's, it's deliberately vague, because different people like different languages. But you can make Java run as fast as C++. And you just need to be careful not to use some of its features fully. Okay, that's the end of my comparison between big data and simulations. Thank you very much.